There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. I'd like you to open the Word of God with me to the Gospel according to John. To John chapter number 20. If you were in the Bible teaching hour earlier today, perhaps you have your place marked here already because we started looking at Peter and looking at John and looking at Thomas, these original disciples that have their own encounter with the Lord. But I bring you now not to one of the men, but to a woman. Aren't you glad Christ died for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl? I bring you now not to one of the first disciples. See, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, I'm not really a church person. I'm not a preacher or I'm not a Sunday school teacher or I'm not you fill in the blank. Let me tell you something. Christ died for every man and God loves all people. And this is fascinating to me. It's really fascinating that when Jesus came out of the grave, look, He could have come out of the grave in such a spectacular way, in a public way, that everybody on earth saw him at that moment. But he didn't choose to do that. He could have showed up to hundreds of people at one time. On one occasion, he did just that. As a matter of fact, Corinthians tells us that one time when he showed up and appeared, he showed himself to 500 people at one time. It's not some figment of the imagination, some, some fairy tale, some fantasy. Oh, no, this is, this is factual that Christ came out of the grave bodily, alive, and showed himself. But here's what I bring you to. The first time he showed himself after he came out of the grave, he showed himself to one weeping woman in a garden. Her name is found in John chapter 20 and verse number 1 where the Bible says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene. Early, when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Hollywood has tried to fill in lots of blanks about Mary Magdalene. As a matter of fact, and can I give you a recommendation? Don't let the world tell you what to believe about God. Let God tell you what to believe about the whole world. Now you're on sure footing. The best we can tell, Mary Magdalene, she's a sinful woman. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. But Hollywood has made Mary Magdalene out to be some immoral type woman. And I challenge you to search the gospel records and show me that. It's interesting how people go beyond Scripture just like people fall short of Scripture. My recommendation is let's just stick with Scripture. Let's let God speak for himself. And so I want you to take a trip with me. We're going to go halfway around the world. We're going to go back in time 2,000 years. And I want you to walk into a garden. It's early. It's early. The sun's not up yet. It's still dark. The shadows still linger. We know it's a garden. Back up to chapter 19 and look at verse number 40. When Jesus died, the Bible says, Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Look at verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a what, church? There was a garden. And would you mark the next three words? In the garden, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. Therefore laid they Jesus, therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Think of this. Jesus had no place to lay his head in life or in death. He didn't have a house. Matter of fact, he said to one man one day, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He didn't ha- even have a bed to lay on. And in his death, he had no grave. It was borrowed. It's all right, though. He's only going to use it for three days. He's, he doesn't need it long. And where was the grave? It was in a garden. And early in the morning, here comes Mary. Now, we know from the Scripture in Luke chapter 24, it's not just Mary We know that there are a group of women coming to anoint his body to the burial. And you can compare Scripture to Scripture and see all of this. As a matter of fact, did you know that Jesus Jesus revealed himself on at least a minimum of ten different occasions? 
Some say 11, some say 12, depends on how you number them and how you connect them, but at a minimum of 10 times he showed himself. Let me ask you a question. How many times does the Lord have to show himself before we believe him? Growing up as a boy in the hills of West Virginia, if my mama said it once, we were supposed to listen. If she said it twice, we were really supposed to listen. If she said it three times, it was too late to listen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Not good. If Jesus says at least ten times, hey, I'm alive, that's enough, friends. He's alive. And he shows himself first to Mary. We pick up the story back in John chapter 20 and verse number 11 where the Bible says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. And I love this expression, and knew not that it was Jesus. There's at least three times that phrase is used. There were two disciples one day on the road to Emmaus, and, and a stranger joins their, joins their walk and talks to them a long time. But they didn't know it was Jesus till the end. I love that story. They didn't know it was Jesus till he prayed. Nobody ever said Father like Jesus said Father. In that moment, their eyes were open. Another one's in the next chapter. Don't get too far ahead of me. We'll come back to it. But the disciples are out on a boat fishing, and they see a man on the shore, and he starts talking to them, and they don't know that it's Jesus. And the third occasion is right here where Mary's looking at him. Listen to me, friends. You can be close to God without knowing him. You can be very near without it being very personal to you. If I go stand in a garage, does that make me a car? I think not. And you can sit in a church, but that doesn't make you a Christian. Because what you need is your own encounter with the risen Christ. And that's what's going on here. Look at verse number 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And I love the humor in this. She, supposing him to be the gardener. By the way, he actually was the gardener. He planted that garden. He spoke the whole world into existence. All things consist by his power. But he's more than the gardener. He's the God-man. She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith to him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I'll take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. What a change. What a change. One moment she's weeping. Now she's rejoicing. Let me tell you something, friends. Only Jesus can bring that kind of change. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. And when the Bible says she was weeping, she was weeping. As a matter of fact, the word used here for weeping is not the word for she's crying a little. It is literally a word for sobbing. Look at her, please. Look at her. Shoulders rising and falling, heaving. Tears streaming down her cheeks. She's weeping. She's a picture of a weeping world. We live in a broken world. I mean, let's just be honest. Have you watched the news in the last 24 hours? Have you read a newspaper lately? I wish you could travel with me week after week and all over this country meet people who are just broken. They're broken. And by the way, and everybody on the outside doesn't always know it. Listen to me. She's alone in this garden. Oh, she's really not alone because the Lord is there, but she's alone in this garden weeping. And sometimes the greatest tears are the ones no one else knows about. The ones... Or you lay in bed at night and stare at the ceiling and you think there's got to be more to it than this. I'm missing something. She's weeping in the garden, wounded and weary, hurting. 
in the garden. And I was thinking, preacher, it's fascinating really when you think all through Scripture how many times God meets people in the garden. Hey, where did this all start? That's right. God planted a garden, called it Eden, put Adam and Eve there. And I love this. The voice of the Lord God came walking through that garden in the cool of the day. From the beginning, God met man in a garden, a peaceful place, a quiet place where he could just speak to them and have their undivided attention. You read Song of Solomon, that great love story. It's not just about married love. It's a picture of Christ's love for us. And when you read Song of Solomon, do you know where the bride and the bridegroom met? Do you know where they rendezvous? They meet in the garden. That's where Christ shows himself to his bride. It's it's powerful. When Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross and die, he takes Peter and James and John with him. Where does he take them to pray? He takes them into a what church? Into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. That was Jesus' prayer clause. That's how Judas knew the place. The Bible says Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. I'm telling you, there's something about the garden. The Lord loves the garden. And here, that's where he shows himself first in the garden. He show himself later on a, on a shore, on a road to Emmaus, and in an upper room. But here, he meets Mary when she's alone, and it's just her and God. And he reveals himself to her. Two or three simple thoughts I want to show you from this beautiful story. And by the way, I love all the resurrection accounts, all of them. Somebody said, my favorite one is whichever one I'm reading at the time. I understand that. But if I had to pick one, this would be my favorite. It's just, I don't know why. There is a tenderness to it. There is a sincerity to it. There is a beauty to it and a simplicity that is just, oh, I identify with it. And I think, dear Lord, that's not just what Mary needed. That's what I need. What does God show us in this story in the garden? Number one, I see her human disappointment. She is one disappointed woman. We live in a disappointed world. Did you know suicide is up 300% from my father's generation to my generation? 300%. And I see them everywhere I go, empty. And I think about the words of Solomon right now, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. People with full hands and empty hearts. By the way, do you know what an empty tomb does? An empty tomb makes it so you can have your heart full. God does the exact opposite, you see. And here's a woman, she's grieving and she's weeping and she's sorrowful. Why? She's disappointed by her own sin, no doubt. As a matter of fact, when Jesus met her, the Bible says that she had seven devils in her. (laughs) Seven devils? One devil's bad enough. She's a demon-possessed woman. And I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you say, well, I can't identify with that. I'm a good moral person. You missed the picture. Seven is a number of completion. It means, watch this please, that she was completely under the power of the devil because she did not belong to Jesus yet. But watch this. The moment she came to Jesus, Jesus cast all of those others out. Let me tell you something. There's not room for Jesus and everybody else. It's Christ. By the way, she never regretted the day she met Jesus. I've made a lot of dumb decisions. Any of you ever made a dumb decision? I lived a lot of days. I wish I had a do-over button, and I, I have regrets for but Let me tell you, 37 years ago this year, a lady took a Bible like the one I'm preaching from this morning and told me for the first time that God loved me. I had heard that he died and was buried and rose from the dead, but for the very first time she explained to me that he did all of that for me. And that day I bowed my head and I prayed a simple prayer and I invited the Lord Jesus to come into my life and be my personal Savior. Let me tell you something. I've never been disappointed with Jesus Christ. I've never once wished I wasn't going to heaven. Not once. I never one day got up and said, I wish Jesus wasn't with me today. Not a single day of my life. I'm going to tell you something. Sin and the devil and this world and your best effort, all of that will disappoint and discourage and disillusion in the end. Only Jesus brings meaning and fulfillment in this life and in the life to come. Only Christ can do that. Look at her human disappointment. Sin is always a disappointment. 
that God always saves the best for last. The devil does the exact opposite. He gives you his best up front, and it's all downhill from there. So finally, you're standing at the end of life, wrecked and ruined, and missing something and thinking, I wish I had it all to do over again. Let me tell you what you need. You need an encounter with the risen Christ. Not only is she disappointed by her own sin, she's disappointed by her situation. Anybody in this room have a perfect life? Just curious, anybody? And I don't know you. See, that's the amazing thing about the Word of God. God knows all of us, and His truth connects to every one of us. And you might even look at a preacher and think, well, you know, that guy doesn't have the problems I have. He's not dealing with what I'm dealing with. No, we're all different. We all got our own problems. But let me tell you something. We all have our messes. We all have our situations. And Mary, here she is with with unrealized expectations. Her world's just fallen apart. All of her dreams are shattered. Her Messiah is gone. Not only has he been crucified, he's been in a grave for three days. Now his body has disappeared. He can't get much worse than where she is. What she doesn't know, though, is she's standing on the brink of a great knowledge of something she's never known before. Maybe life hadn't turned out for you. Maybe your circumstances have been less than desirable. Maybe the situation you find yourself in today is not one you would have chosen for yourself. But let me tell you something. If it is the situation that brings you to Jesus, it is worth everything because the greatest thing in life is the personal knowledge of a living Savior. And so I see in this story not only human disappointment, I see a divine appointment. God has an amazing way of taking disappointments and making them appointments with Him. For the record, can I tell you something? This meeting today is a divine appointment for every one of us. I don't know how you got here. Somebody gave you a card? Some family member told you you had to come today to have Easter dinner with them? I don't know how you got here. Some friend said, come on, I'll save you a seat. I don't know how you got here, but I know this. I know there is a living Christ in this building at this moment as surely as he was in the garden 2,000 years ago, and he wants to meet you, and he wants you to meet him. Today is a day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. Look at the question the angels ask her. Look at verse number 13. They say unto her, woman, what's the next word, church? Verse number 13, woman, what's the word? Why? Don't we ask that a lot? Why weepest thou? My mind goes back to Psalm, I think it's Psalm 34, where the psalmist in the Old Testament says, Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Isn't that the great question of every man? Why did this happen to me? Why do I feel this way? Why am I battling this? Why am I going through this? Why hasn't it turned out my way? Woman, why weepest thou? But watch this. It wasn't a meeting with angels she needed. It was a meeting with Jesus. If I said to you, we're going to have a group of angels in here this afternoon at 1 o'clock, they want to talk to all of you, would you come? Yes, sure you would. Unless you say, well, that's too spooky for me, I'm not coming. I'd be interested enough to come. I'd round up some neighbors and say, they don't know that church down the street, they're having angels at 1 o'clock. That's an Easter to remember right there. But watch this. Did you ever notice that the angels speaking to her did not meet her need? She did not stop crying when the angels spoke to her. She did not get angels get answers by meeting with angels. See, some of you, you're waiting on some chill up your spine or lightning bolt from heaven or some grand experience or euphoric emotion. Let me just tell you something. That probably is never going to come, but even if it does, it's not going to meet the deepest need of your life because only Jesus Christ can do that. Look at the next verse. Verse 14, when she thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus stand. You know what you need today? You need a fresh glimpse of Jesus. Hey, get your eyes off of your why. Get your eyes off of your circumstances. And get your eyes off everybody else around you. And get your eyes off what the world is doing. And get your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking, look, lift your head up. Looking unto Jesus, the altar and finisher of our faith. Look away from everybody and everything else and yourself and look to Jesus. Isaiah 45, 22 says, Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. One of the greatest preachers ever lived, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, stumbled into a church one morning in the midst of a driving snowstorm. The pastor didn't even show up that day. Then a deacon 
who stumbled through his message, read the verse I just quoted to you, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And he looked up and he saw a kid sitting in the mezzanine by himself, about 12 or 13 years of age, and he caught his eye and he said, young man, young man, you look miserable and you always will be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death. Look to Jesus and be saved this morning. Charles Haddon Spurgeon later said that moment I caught a glimpse of Christ. He said, I looked, and I could have looked my eyes away. Let me tell you something. You'll never get sorry, and you'll never get tired of looking to Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. Look at him on that cross. Suspended between life and death, between heaven and hell, with arms outstretched, reaching to every man, saying, I love you this much. Look to Jesus. It's midnight in the middle of the day as God the Father turns his back on his own son. And the lights go out at noon. And for three hours it's dark, and one cry pierces the darkness from the cross. Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, my God, my God, why? Why hast thou forsaken me? We can answer that question on this side of the cross. God the Father forsook his son so you'd never have to be forsaken. Christ was separated from his Father so that you would never have to be separated from God forever in hell. Listen to me. Maybe all of your questions won't get answered. Maybe all of your whys won't make sense on this side of eternity. But I want you to know something. The great need you have is not to understand something. It is to meet someone, and his name is Jesus Christ. Notice how Jesus leads her. Look at verse number 19. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, see if this question sounds familiar. Why weepest thou? Notice he does not let her answer. He asks another question. He's leading her somewhere. What's the next word? Whom seekest thou? See, her real need was not about a why. It was about a who. I have no idea who I'm preaching to right now, but look at me in the eye just a moment, my friend. I want to tell you on the authority of the Word of God today that whatever the question you're grappling with and struggling with and straining under at this moment in your life, that question is designed to do one thing, and that is to drive you to the only one who is the answer, and that is Jesus Christ. Christ is bringing her to himself. Hey, let me tell you some good news on Easter. God right now is trying to bring every one of us to himself. Somebody said, what's this world coming to? It's coming to Jesus eventually. I didn't mean everybody's going to be saved, but someday every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. Might be good if you did it now and don't wait till then. Come to Jesus. What did she need? She needed a fresh glimpse of Christ. What did she need? She needed a word from the Lord. Did you come to hear my sermon today? Because my sermon can't change your life. But you know what you need? If you can hear the tender voice of God whispering your name, friend, that will change your life forever. I'm not trying to be mystical. I'm just saying to you there's a real God. He's in this place. He's speaking and moving and working at this moment. Are you in tune with him? Are you listening to him? Notice what Jesus says to her. One word. Look at verse 16. I love it. Jesus saith unto her. What's he say, church? All he says is her name. Let me tell you something wonderful. Nobody says your name like Jesus says your name. We can be in a crowded place with hundreds of young people, but there's three kids on earth. If they say, Daddy, I know who they're talking about. There's one woman sitting right back here that nobody says my name quite like she says my name. When she says it, most of the time it's tender, most of the time. (laughs) Nobody says my name like she says my name, but let me tell you spiritually, when Jesus calls your name, he's got your number. He's speaking to your need. And at this moment, he's saying, Mary, he's speaking to you. She runs toward him. She's going to grab him by the feet. She she responds to him as master. Look at verse 17. He says, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. Let's stop here just a second. This is fascinating to me. Because did you understand later in the same chapter he's going to tell Thomas, you can touch me? He's just come out of the grave and he says to her, don't touch me. But eight days later he's going to say to Thomas, here, you want to believe? Put your finger right there in the print of the nails if you'd like. What's the difference? Some people believe that there was an ascension before the ascension. 
And when he came out of the grave alive forevermore, he presented himself first in that garden. Then he went back to heaven and presented the blood to the heavenly Father on the mercy seat. I like that, don't you? Again, be certain about all of that. There's some things I can't explain to you today. If you want me to explain all of it, I can't. I'll tell you why, because i got a pea brain. That's what I have. I'm a finite man. He's an infinite God. There's some things I can't explain to you. But really, do you know what the word touch here means? It doesn't simply mean don't touch me. It literally means, look, don't, don't hold on to me. I love this. He says to her, and look, she just found him. She's lost his body. Now she's found him and he's alive. Don't you know she'd like to hold on to him and not let go? And he says to her, no, no, you don't understand. You're not going to hold on to me physically because I'm going back to my father. Oh, this is beautiful. See, on Easter, we celebrate the resurrection. But do you understand 40 days later, he will ascend back to the Father. That's where he is at this moment, seated at the right hand of the Father, praying for us. Robert Burr McShane said, if I could hear Jesus praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a thousand enemies. Then he stopped and said, but the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. See, somebody probably prayed for you this morning. Maybe somebody in this room prayed for you this morning. But let me tell you, if nobody on earth calls your name to God, Jesus is praying for you by name today. He's speaking to you for his Father, and he's speaking to the Father for you. What's he saying to Mary? He's saying, look, you can't hold me physically. Now you're going to have to take me by faith. You're going to have to trust me. See, some of you, you're trying to find some tangible thing to grab a hold of. That's why people say, oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get baptized. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to join the church. The other night, last Sunday night, actually, I was in Houston, Texas, preaching. I went back to the hotel. I had a really, really early flight the next morning. Went back to the hotel right at the airport, and a boy picked me up, shuttle driver. I was on the phone when he picked me up. I got off the phone. We started chatting a little bit, and I asked this young man. His name was Melvin. I said, Melvin, you, you go to church anywhere? He said, well, I've been studying with a certain group, and he told me what group it was, not a group that teaches the Bible. And here's what he said to me. He said, you know, mister, he said, I've been really disappointed. I said, how so? He said, well, I've gotten baptized more than once. And he said, I joined this group, and I've been studying really hard. He said, it just seems like I keep going back to my old sins over and over and over again. And I said, Melvin, I can tell you why that is. Because you don't need what any group can give you. You need Jesus. Sitting, in the, sitting under the overhang of that airport hotel, he bowed his head and trusted Christ as his Savior. Let me tell you something, friend. What you need today is Jesus. He's enough. Say, you don't know my need. Jesus does. He's enough. Say, you don't know what I've done. Jesus does. He's enough. You say, you don't know where I am. No, Jesus does. He's enough. And he makes it real personal. Look what he says in verse number 17. He says, I want you to go tell them that I'm going to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Watch this. He says, I just want you to know that you're going to enter in to the same kind of access that I have. Let me tell you, when Jesus swung the door to heaven and God opened, he swung it open real wide. And he said, everybody that's interested, y'all follow me. Everybody follow me. By the way, everybody gets in somebody's line. I'd rather be in Jesus' line than anybody's line. Because Muhammad's still at his grave and Confucius is still dead and Buddha's still gone, but Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. There's a third thing I see. It's not only her human disappointment and this divine appointment, but then I see her personal assignment. (laughs) By the way, she didn't have to be told more than once. Look at verse number 17. He says, go to my brethren and say unto them. In other words, won't you go tell somebody? Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Reminds me of the disciples in Acts when they could not help but speak the things they'd seen and heard. Let me tell you something. Nobody's got to make you do right once you meet Jesus. Nobody's got to beat you over the head to tell somebody that you're a Christian once you meet Jesus. (laughs) And nobody else has got to motivate you to get in church. Please get in church. Not when you really know Jesus, because when you come to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ and think of what he's done for you, friend, whatever personal assignment he gives you, you say, I'm happy to do that. We love him because what? He first loved us. Friends, he always goes first. When was the last time you said to Jesus, I love you? Maybe the right way to say it is, I love you too. Because he said it first. 
And I want you to know what I'm talking about today is not just from history. This is personal. This is not just for Mary. This is for me. This is for you. And every person in this room, if you're breathing right now, take a deep breath, would you? Isn't that nice? God gave you that. If you're breathing right now, there's a God who loves you and a Christ who died for you and a Holy Spirit who's speaking to you through the Word of God. And at this moment, what's He trying to do? He's trying to reveal Himself to you and draw you to Himself. And I prayed something before I got up tonight, this morning. The Bible says, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men to me. I prayed that. And I said to the Lord, now, Lord, you promised that if Jesus was lifted up, you would draw people to yourself. And I must tell you, when I'm done today, I I really don't care what all you remember of what I said, but I want you to have caught a glimpse of Christ and to have heard from Christ because I believe this. If you get a glimpse of Jesus and hear him speak your name, friend, you'll be drawn to him. Nobody will have to drive you to him. He will draw you. His name was Austin. Early one morning, he was reading his Bible. Very early in the morning, he he was reading through the gospel according to John, and he came to John chapter 20. And he later testified, he said, as I read John 20, he said, it was like I was in the garden. I was there. He said, I I was standing off to the side in my mind and and I could see Mary weeping and I could see this stranger that she thinks is the gardener. I could hear the conversation between them. And he said, then I watched as the gardener spoke her name and suddenly she knew it's Jesus. And he said, I watched the change in her countenance and her body language. I, I could see Her weeping turned to rejoicing. He said it was like the whole thing just turned. And he said, suddenly I realized that's what the Lord wants to do for everybody. He wants to come into your garden. Hey, Adam. Hey, Eve. The Lord's still walking through the garden. He's still speaking. Austin Miles sat down at his desk, took out a clean sheet of paper, and a pen. Would you take out your hymn book just a moment? Everybody find a hymn book. I'm not going to sing, so you can relax, all right? We'll leave that to the singers. Turn to hymn 320. It's an old hymn. We don't sing it a lot anymore. Shame, really. It's a great one. And it was born out of a personal encounter with a risen Christ. Do you see his name? Top left-hand corner, right under 320. Do you see his name? C. Austin Miles. That's him. Matter of fact, I like your hymn book. I was looking at it earlier. Your, your hymn book put under the title in parentheses, this song is based upon the meeting of Jesus and Mary on resurrection morning as recorded in St. John chapter 20. That's exactly what we've just been studying. And here's what he wrote. Look at it. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear, falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. He speaks. And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. I'd stay in the garden with him. Though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go. Through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. And I love the chorus. Look at it. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Would you look at me just a moment? I want you to know there's nobody on earth that can do for you what Jesus can do for you. And there's nothing on earth that will meet the deepest need of your heart like Jesus Christ can. Watch, please. When you walk out those doors in a minute, and we're all getting ready to go, when you walk out those doors, he wants to walk with you. The one who's speaking to you right now, he'd like to talk with you as you go. He'd like to be as near to you as your very breath. Will you come to Jesus? I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes with me and sit very still and quiet for a moment without any moving around. I just don't want to distract people. We're not going to sing this morning, but we're going to pray. In a few moments, I'm going to ask the pianist if she'll play this hymn. But before she plays any of it, 
Before we play any music, I'd like to ask a question or two. And I'd like to ask you to be honest. Will you be honest? An honest man, an honest woman. And I'm going to give you my word before I ask the questions. You don't know me. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm not in the business of embarrassing people. I'm not interested in that. I'm not into that at all. We didn't come to make a spectacle of you today. This is not, this is not between me and you. This is between you and God. I'm just here on the Lord's bidding today. But I'm going to ask you to be an honest person, honest with God who knows the truth. Don't lie to Him. It's dangerous to lie to a God who knows everything. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with this preacher. No one else is looking right now. How many people in this room can say, Preacher, if I died where I'm seated right now in the next 60 seconds and stood face to face with God and had to give an account of my life, I'm not, or let's start this way. I am sure. I am sure. A hundred percent sure that if I died in the next 60 seconds, I'm ready. My sins are forgiven. Christ lives in me. I know I'm going to heaven. I know that I have truly believed on Christ. That's settled. I want you to lift your hand in the air. Hold it high a moment. With your hand raised to heaven, would you thank God for just a moment? Just thank Him. Let's just start with there. I know that I've been saved. There's no doubt. Thank you, Jesus, for that. What a wonderful Savior we have. You may lower your hands. Now let's ask the other side. Because some of you couldn't raise your hand with confidence a moment ago. You got some doubt about it. Well, maybe you've been baptized. Maybe you are a member of a church. Maybe you've prayed lots of prayers. But you'd be honest enough to say, you know, I got questions like Mary did. The reality is I'm not sure. I'm just not sure that if I met God in the next 60 seconds that my sins are forgiven and heaven is my home. But preacher, I'm sure of this. I don't want to go to hell. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'm sure I don't want to be lost, and I'm concerned enough about my soul to ask you to pray for me. Preacher, I don't have that kind of personal relationship with Christ, but I need it. Will you pray for me? If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up in the air with mine quickly, long enough for me to see it, then pull it right back down and say, pray for me. I'm not certain that my sins are forgiven. Pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm ready to meet God like I am. Pray for me. Anyone like that at all, pray for me. I need to be saved. I need the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for me. I want you to know if that's you this morning, that God loves you. That Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead, but He went a step further. He wants to come live in your life forever. I'd like to give you an opportunity this morning to put your faith and trust in Jesus. As a matter of fact, right where you're seated this morning, If you know that you're a sinner and you believe that Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead and you truly want to have your sins forgiven and you want a personal relationship with Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right where you sit to call on God to forgive your sin. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm not asking you to give a speech in front of this church. I'm asking you to call on God right now and ask Him to be your Savior. If that's you and your need right now, would you pray something like this from your heart to God? Right now, would you simply say, Dear God, I'm a sinner. If I get what I deserve, I would not go to heaven. But I don't want to go to hell. I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I believe that He rose from the dead. Forgive my sin and come live in my life. I trust you right now to be my personal Savior. Give me a new heart and eternal life. Thank you for dying for me. If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. 
we hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day, and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit, and don't miss Enjoying the Journey daily devotional podcast each Monday through Friday.